Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and hello everyone. In this series, we will be implementing the famous GPU gems articles one by one. And today, we will have effective water simulation from physical models, the first chapter. And as you can see, this is my implementation of the first chapter. You can try it out on GitHub, the link will be down below. This implementation is quite complicated. For example, on the top right, we can change the view to the normal positions of the vertices, we can add waves, we can remove waves, we can change the waves parameters, we can manipulate them, for example, let's change the amplitude, and it will be changed in the scene. And in this video, we will not be implementing these crazy stuff, we will be implementing a simpler version of this project. So, let's remove the tutorials, the surface, the UI, and the background. And this is what we will end up with, and this is what we will be creating for today's video. But before we start writing any code, we need to understand a few things. So the first thing we need to understand is how to like and subscribe. Click here, click there, and if you still don't know how, right here. The second thing we need to understand is who am I? I'm Mohammed, my nickname is Mohido, and today we will have a programming video. So the third thing we need to understand is a little bit of math. So, as you guessed thus far, we need to generate waves, and the best way to generate them is by using the famous trigonometric functions, the sine and cosine. But don't be scared, because we will not be diving into why they work, we will only be using them as black boxes. So, we're only going to know how they work, and how to use them. So, the simplest way to describe them, the trigonometric functions, either the sine or cosine, is that they take an angle, and they return a coordinate. So, let's imagine we have a circle, and a circle by default contains all the angles between 0 and 360, or 0 to 2 pi. And for each of the angles, the sine will return the y coordinate, and the cosine will return the x coordinate. And when we reach angle 90, the cosine will return 0, and the sine will return 1. And now you might be asking yourself, how did we end up with circles? We started with waves, and we ended up with circles. But how? So, to understand this better, we have to look at it from a different perspective. Let's go to the 3D graph, and here we have the x-axis and y-axis, similar to what we had in the 2D. However, we have a new axis, the z-axis, and this axis will resemble the change in angles. And if we look into the graph from the y's perspective, we can see that the cosine taking place. It starts from positive x, positive 1, and then it fluctuates between negative 1 and positive 1 as the angle increases. And similar, if we look from the x perspective, we can see the sine function taking place. It takes an angle, and based on that angle, it returns the y coordinate. So what I'm trying to say over here is that if you look at them from top down, they resemble a circle. And if you expand your perspective a little bit and gave a new axis, the angle axis, the z axis in our case, and looked into that axis, you're going to find that they return a wave, not a circle. Since they oscillate between positive 1 and negative 1 in a wavy pattern based on a given angle, we are going to use them as the basis for our wave system. And if you still do not comprehend what's happening, it's fine, absolutely okay. Just memorize that given an angle, they return the coordinates of the x-axis or the y-axis. And the cosine corresponds to the x-axis, while the sine corresponds to the y-axis. Now, let's look into how we can create interesting waves using the sine and cosine. Now, let's focus on the amplitude. The amplitude is the height of the wave. And to increase the height of the wave, we can multiply the trigonometric functions with any constant. For example, let's try multiplying it with different numbers. And as you can see, the height changes. So, I'll just be creating a constant that we can control with the slider. The second most important feature about waves is that if we multiply the x, the angle, in our case, by a constant, we can increase the length of the wave or reduce it. And in other words, if we're going to multiply it with larger constant, we're going to increase the number of cycles. And if we're going to multiply it with lower constant, we're going to decrease the number of cycles, meaning we can control the wave frequency by multiplying the angle with a constant. And the final important thing about the wave's parameters is that if we add an angle to the current angle, we are going to shift the wave, meaning we are going to move the entire wave to the left or to the right, changing its phase. And again, I'll be creating a constant to control it with a slider. And now we know how to change the amplitude of the wave, which is the height of the wave. We know how to change the frequency of the wave, which is how many cycles we have. And also, we know how to change the phase of the wave, meaning moving the wave to the left or to the right. 
We've been doing it on sine thus far and the same concepts apply on the cosine as well. We cannot simulate the ocean with a single wave so we are going to use another important feature about waves is that if you use some waves with different frequencies you can create interesting looking waves. So by the knowledge we have thus far we can just create a bunch of sine functions and then change their parameters, sum them up and generate interesting waves. So are we done? And the answer is of course not. In nature, waves have an interesting shape, which is a little bit curvy shape. They have small tops and very fat thighs, very fat bottoms. That's what nature loves. And sadly, we cannot simulate that with our current knowledge. We can introduce a new trick, which is powering up the trigonometric functions. So for example, if we power the sine function, it will have smaller tops and fat bottoms. So with the current knowledge, we can just power up the sine functions and sum them up to generate interesting waves. So is that enough? Can we generate realistic waves with that knowledge? The answer is absolutely yes, we can do that, but not in 3D. I mean, we can use it in 3D, but we will lose a lot of details. And the main reason is that because in 3D, we do not have curvy, continuous looking lines. We only have points describing that line. And as you can see, I have created points along the sine wave and these points will resemble the continuous curve. So as you can see with this current implementation, if we increase the power of the wave, if we make it a little bit steep, let's say we will have a lot of geometry down below in the flat surface, the boring surface, and we will lose a lot of geometry in the interesting curve. So in summary, if we have a continuous curve, then that's perfect, we can use it. But in 3D, we have discrete points resembling the wave, so we cannot use it. We cannot just move the waves, the points up and down, and expect the details to be the same. So what can we do if you want to preserve the details of these scandalous curvy areas and also have a steep wave? What about this idea? Instead of moving the points up and down, we can also move them left and right. And this will lead us to the most important wave algorithm implemented in computer graphics, the Gerstner wave algorithm. But away from the fancy naming, let's focus on how it works. And if we think about it for a minute, we need a way to move the points near the middle of the wave while not touching the points at the top or the bottom of the wave. And how can we determine that? That's easy, just by using the sister of the wave function that we have. In our case, in my case, I use the sine as the main wave function, so the sister of the sine is always the cosine. And remember, when the sine reaches one or negative one, the cosine will be reaching zero. So if the sine is reaching zero, then the cosine will be either negative one or one. So in other words, the cosine at the middle of the wave will be equal to one or negative one. And at the top or the bottom, it will be equal to zero or close to zero. And as you can see in this example, we have the k of x, which will take x and will return the new position of x, meaning it will just add a cosine to it. So after adding a cosine and moving the x points by the cosine value, we see the points at the top forming a loop. That's because the cosine moved the points a little bit too much. And according to the article, the way to solve it is multiply the cosine with the inverse of the frequency. And here we have a steep wave, as you can see, and the Q over here determines how steep it is. If one, that means it's fully steep. If it's zero, that means it's not steep at all. It's normal sine function. And if you survived thus far, congratulations, because you now understand how the Gerson wave algorithm works. This is how it was implemented in 2D, but to implement it in 3D, the idea is quite similar. We just take the same exact approach and we just move the Y position as well as the X position. However, the only difference is that in 3D, we have the wave direction, which is the wind direction, let's say, and that will be the only difference from the implementation between 2D and 3D. Other than that, we just create multiple waves and we sum them up to create fantastic, realistic ocean or waves. So in 2D, we have the X resembling the angle, while in 3D, instead of having only one axis, the X axis, we also have the Y axis. Since the trigonometric functions do not accept points, they only accept numbers, how can we transform the vector, the point, the location into a number? By using the dot product. So what we can do is project all the points into the wind direction. And after projecting the points, we will get one number and that number will resemble our angle in 3D. So the D in the 3D equation will just resemble the projection between the point and the wind direction. And for the Y position of the point, we just move it along the Y wind direction. And for the X position of the point, we just move it also around the wind X direction. 
So in concept, it's quite similar to the 2D version, but we have one more axis and we need to consider the wind direction and that's it. And keep in mind that I oversimplified many of the concepts written in the article. And if you finish this video, go give the article a read. And if you find something interesting, write it down below. And finally, we're done with the mathematics. Let's go to the next part. The fourth part we need to understand is how the graphics pipeline work and what's our plan to implement the project. Since we are going to use the graphical processing unit, the GPU for short, since it's much faster, we need to understand how it works. So this is an oversimplification of how the GPU works, but long story short, it takes data from the application, for example, vertices and images, and then it processes them. First of all, it, they go through the vertex shader and then the output of the vertex shader will be passed to the fragment shader and then the fragment shader will generate our image. So the vertex shader and the fragment shader are things, programs that we are going to write ourselves and give them to the GPU. And the flow will start from the top to the bottom. Of course, the vertex shader will be initiated first. It will work on each vertex on each point individually and then the output of the vertex shader will be passed to the fragment shader and then the fragment shader will be working on each pixel trying to render each pixel individually in parallel and then the output of the fragment shader will be a complete image which we will have in our application. So this is what's known as the graphics pipeline and in our application we are going to use two of these. So in our first pass, the first graphics pipeline, we are going to input the vertices of the plane and it's going to output the position of the wave baked in a texture in an image. And in the second pipeline or in the second pass, we are going to use the texture which contains the positions of the plane that we saw from the first pass. And we are going to use that texture to displace the plane vertices in the second pass. I know this is an overkill for this project. We can do it all in one pass, but it's more optimized and best practice to do it in two passes. So again, in summary, the first pass will output the positions in a texture, in an image, and then we are going to use that image in the second pass, in the second graphics pipeline to manipulate the vertices of the plane. And for the text stack, I'm going to use JavaScript and 3GS, the famous 3D library, because they are the easiest to implement the projects with and they are the most popular. And if you find some limitations, if we hit a wall with 3GS in the future with some other projects, we can switch to C++ or OpenGL or any other text stack. So enough with the theory part. Now the fifth thing you finally need to do is to open your best editor and follow me in this journey. Quick disclaimer, this is not a beginner friendly JavaScript tutorial or 3GS tutorial. So I'll be skipping many of the concepts. I expect you to know a little bit of 3GS or at least a little bit of general 3D programming concepts to be able to follow. So with that said, let's begin. Create a new empty HTML file, change the title, paste the 3GS import map, put some stars, zero margin, zero padding and overflow hidden. Create script element for our code, import the three module and the camera orbit controls. Create a WebGL renderer. Check if your browser supports WebGL2 because we will be using it in the future. Make the canvas same size as the window. Add the canvas to the web page. Define ocean width, ocean height, segmentation details, and texture size. Define the maximum number of waves which we will be using in our shader code. And let's define our waves and with one wave in it. Create plane geometry resembling the ocean. And the render target with the texture size which will be the output of the first pass. Making the code readable. Create a helper function to get the time because we will be using the time later on. And make sure to scale the time down because the wave will be otherwise moving incredibly fast. Create a list resembling our two passes. Define the scene for our first pass. Define orthographic camera which will be the same size as the ocean and orthogonal to the ocean looking at the ocean directly. Put an undefined variable for the ocean mesh. Create an init function which we will use to initialize the scene. Move the camera backwards and let it look at the center of the scene. Create a new mesh using the ocean geometry and the shader material and assign it to the ocean variable inside the pass. Edit the shader material properties. The uniforms will be gotten from this function which we will define later. The vertex shader code also will be gotten from another function. The code for the fragment shader is not a lot, so here it is. It expects a vector 3 from the vertex shader and it writes it down to the texture at location 0. After initializing the mesh, let's add it to the scene. Create a render function inside the first pass and it will render to the target we defined earlier. For debugging purposes, let's create another function called view, which will render to the screen instead of the render target we defined earlier. Let's define the two functions we used in the material initialization. The waves to uniform function will transform the waves parameters into uniforms that we can use in the shader code. As you can see, we need the wave counts, we need the frequencies, we need the inverse of their frequencies, we need the phases, amplitudes, directions of the winds, and finally the steepness of the wave. 
As expected, we define the vertex shader and it will be using the uniforms we pass through the material. Hello, this is Future Mojito, and if you know programming, you know that there is an error with this code, we will be fixing that later. Make the vertex shader spread the new position on the fragment shader. In the main function, set the position to zero. For each of the waves, get the waves parameters. Normalize the direction, and as explained earlier, the dot product will be used as our angle. Now we define the sister waves for our Gerstner algorithm. Update the positions of the point based on the Gerstner equation explained earlier. Make sure to normalize the steepness by dividing by the waves count. Make sure to output the old position because we need to output a quad so it can be rendered as a texture. And as you can see, the vertex shader will pass the end position to the fragment shader because we defined it as a varying in both shaders. The logic of the code so far seems correct, so let's start by initializing the passes and then render them. Create an animate function which on each frame will be rendering the passes one by one. And we have a simple copy paste bug, so let's change the max count into max waves, m waves. It seems working fine, but a little bit static, so let's animate it. Create an update function, which will update the phase of the wave. Use the same equation as we used in the waves to uniform function. Great, now we have a displacement map, which we can use in the second pass. A displacement map is a texture defining how much we should offset vertices. So, copy paste the first pass, change the camera into perspective view, make the init function empty, Change the render function so it draws to the screen. And the update function should only update the orbit controls. In the init, update the camera parameters. Define an orbit controls. And define the mesh. And of course, the material of the mesh will be using the texture in the render target, which was the output of the first pass. And in the vertex shader, we are going to use the UV coordinate to sample from the displacement map and then add it to the current position and then return the current position. And then we transform it and then pass it to the GPU so it does some manipulations and then it passes it to the fragment shader as a pixel and then in the fragment shader we color it with the beautiful blue color of the ocean. Now let's update the animate function so it updates and then renders all the passes one by one. And here we go, we have a moving wave. The source code of this project will be on my GitHub and the link will be down below in the description.